Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night to you, wherever, whenever you might be watching this video. Welcome to Algebra 2, Section 5-4, and today we're going to be focusing on identifying zeros of polynomial functions. Higher degree polynomial functions, but specifically we're going to focus on cubics that start off with an x to the third term today. All right, as we get started today, um, you can see that on Google Classroom we have uploaded a blank version of the notes, a completed version of the notes, and this video that you are currently watching. You probably will get the most out of this video if you take a blank set of notes and work through the problems with me um, at the same time. But you are welcome to print up a completed version of notes and simply add your own words or side notes in the margins. Um, if you so choose. So to get started today, um, we have a daily quiz, which if you were in the classroom, we would quickly have you do these two problems on your own with a dis desk buddy with your whole pod um, and check your answers with each other. But since we're not together today, I have worked out the synthetic division on problem B already. Go ahead and set up both synthetic divisions for number uh, problem A and problem B and start working on them if you feel confident to do so. Otherwise, um, just a reminder of how the process works with problem A. We have the function f of x, we have the function g of x, and you are asked to divide f of x by g of x. So to do that, in synthetic division, we strip away all the x's and only leave the numbers. So I have 1, negative 5, negative 4, and 20 from the function f of x, and out in front, I have the opposite of the number that is in our divisor that we are dividing by. So that's a negative 2, the opposite of the positive 2 you see in g of x. All right, so to do the actual synthetic division, we start the process by taking the first coefficient and dragging it down to become the first coefficient in our answer. So we start off with a 1, and then we multiply that back times the divisor that is out in front. These two numbers get multiplied. So 1 times negative 2, will give us negative 2, and we put that result in the next spot in the inside of the synthetic division. Add down, we get negative 7, repeat the process again. So now in the next step, negative 7 is getting multiplied by negative 2, and the result of that is positive 14, going in the next spot in the synthetic division. Add down, positive 10, repeat one more time, multiplying 10 back times negative 2, and this time we end up getting a happy result where in our last column we have no remainder. So remember when you get to this point, it is your job to take those numbers at the bottom of the synthetic division and turn them back into a function that actually makes sense for our answer, the dividend of f of x divided by g of x. So the one that is in front stands for 1 x to the second power because if we started with x to the cubed power or x to the third power, our answer when we do synthetic division will be one degree lower than that. So one is for x squared, negative seven is our coefficient for x, and positive ten is simply the last term of our answer. But you absolutely should be writing these answers in a factored form if possible. So in the next step, I'm going to break apart x squared minus 7x plus 10 using the factoring method, the big factoring x to keep us organized that we did a lot of in unit 4. So if you remember, we put the multiplication of a times c in the top of that x, and we put the b term in the bottom, and we're looking for what two numbers would multiply together to make that top term happen, and what would add to make the bottom term happen, negative 7. So if we're going to multiply to 10 and add to negative 7, the only way to do that is to use 5 and 2, and I would have to make both of them negative. So this, in its factored form, will look like x minus 5 and x minus 2. This is the best form that we can give the answer to this question of what is f of x divided by g of x. Final answer, x minus 5, x minus 2. All right, to do the same for part B is your job next. I'm going to pause and come back with the answer. 
All right, so now we're back, and we've taken the values at the bottom of the synthetic division and put them back into an order that makes sense to give our answer for the synthetic division in part B. But I've left that last part of the remainder of negative 2 for us to fill in. If you are at all wondering what the heck is I am I supposed to use for my divisor, it's x plus 4. What we were originally dividing by is what your remainder will go over. So there is our final answer. And the reason I'm leaving it in this form is that if there's a remainder, it is not going to be factorable, and I will not be able to re write my answer in um, the nice factored form. All right. So now that our review is done, the main purpose of today is to start talking about how do we find real zeros of any function, any polynomial function, <coughs> that we may come across. In Unit 4, we learned how to find the zeros of a quadratic function, so we're going to review that quickly today with just the quadratic function and talk about how do we extend that same idea to now look at functions that look a little bit crazier, like these three examples at the bottom of your notes. Those are all cubic functions. All right, so how many solutions does the following quadratic function have? Well, if you remember where solutions are, they are the places where the function's graph comes in contact with the x-axis. Where does this graph cross the x-axis? And there's two places where it happens, so there are two solutions. Why are there two solutions? Because the highest degree is 2. The fundamental theorem of algebra says if your highest degree on x is 2, the most solutions you could have is 2. Same thing goes with any number. If you have an x to the 63rd power, you will have a possibility of 63 solutions for that function. All right, so how do we find those solutions? When you have a graph, you look at the graph and find those places where the function touches the x-axis. Easiest way to, be, to get the job done. But if you don't have a graph, then you have to factor or do quadratic formula. Now, honestly, of the two skills that I would most like you all to have from Unit 4, I would like everybody to be able to factor, but not everybody's fantastic at factoring. Most people are pretty good at taking numbers and crunching them through a formula, like quadratic formula, so that's going to be our default. We want to use that method whenever possible to find solutions. What are the solutions in this particular picture? Well, they're the locations that I already circled. Negative 1 and positive 3 are the places where this particular function crosses the x-axis. Okay. But if we have to find those solutions by factoring or quadratic formula, we should be able to do that. So I'm going to give you reminders today on the method that I've told you is the default method, quadratic formula. So remember, for quadratic formula, you have to identify what is the a value, the b value, and the c value, because you're going to be plugging numbers in for all three of those variables in the quadratic formula. So for opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, here's what it's going to look like. Opposite of b would be positive 2. Inside the square root, b squared is negative 2 squared minus 4 times a times c looks like this. And then at the bottom, double the a value is just 2 times 1. So inside the square root, we end up getting a 16. Since the square root of 16 is a nice number, we get results that are also very pretty. Once we separate this and attack the positive case and the negative case. So the positive case is going to give us 6 over 2, which is the solution of 3. And the negative case is going to give us negative 2 over 2, which is the solution of negative 1. So this is your solution, and this is your solution. Both of these can still be found by, uh, by factoring if we don't do quadratic formula. So 
that's just a reminder of how we did all of this work with quadratics specifically, which is a, a polynomial function, but we want to be able to extend this to cubic functions, possibly quartic functions, which is a power of 4, and even quintic functions, a power of 5. So for a cubic function, for our first try at finding solutions, we've given you graphs, and we want you to find the solutions on these three graphs. So take a moment right now to look at where do those three graphs cross the y or the x-axis. Find those locations, write them down in a list of solutions in set notation. All right, the solutions for number one. This funky little graph crosses the x-axis at negative 1, positive 2, and positive 3. So this one has three solutions. In example number two, there are only two places where the graph touches or crosses the x-axis. The first location is at negative 4. And clearly there it is crossing the x-axis. The second location is at 0. 0, it's not crossing the x-axis. The function is coming down and headed towards the x-axis until it gets there at 0, and then it, it immediately bounces right back off the x-axis. In that case, that's actually a very special solution that's called a double root. It counts as more than just one root, because bouncing off the x-axis is very strange and unusual. All right, the third case is where we cross the x-axis at just positive 1. So that's very rare, but it takes a um, very boring cubic function that is either got its interesting inflection points happening way below the x-axis or way above the x-axis that will only create one solution like this. It's pretty rare. All right, so if you haven't already taken a break, now would be a good time to take a break for a moment, do some deep breathing. <sighs> Clear your mind. And get ready to put together a whole lot of algebra skills all in one problem. On the back of your notes, I will only be leading you through two of the four examples. This video is already 13 minutes long, and I don't want to keep you any longer than I have to. So for example four, x cubed minus 6x squared plus 5x plus 12, we are being given the first of a couple of zeros for this function. We're being told, hey, x equals four is a solution. It's one of the solutions, it's one of the zeros of that function. Use that value to figure out all the other zeros. So in order to get that job done, we're going to start by doing synthetic division with this actual value. But note, this is the zero, so we do not take the opposite of this value when we put it into the synthetic division. So I also will write in a 1 there for the leading coefficient, and then I'm going to set up my synthetic division to get the ball rolling. So the 4 goes out here without taking the opposite. This is because we are not taking it from a factor or a function. We are using the actual solution itself. All right, 1, negative 6, 5, and 12 are the co coefficients I need to pull out from f of x, and then I'm going to get the synthetic division going. All right, happy results. We got coefficients of 1, negative 2, and negative 3 for the answer. So that means 1x squared minus 2x minus 3 is the function we have left over after we've divided out 
the solution of 4. So this equation that's left over, this has to be solved. We can decide to do that solving by factoring, if you so choose, or by quadratic formula. And since we've practiced quadratic formula, and more people are well-versed at that than they are at factoring, that's what we're going to stick with. So our a, b, and c values are 1, negative 2, and negative 3 just like they were in our example problem here. So we already know what the solutions are going to be for this quadratic equation. For the purposes of making your notes easy to read and understand later, let's go through the work one more time. Opposite of b, plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c. So now I'm just working through quadratic formula, simplifying anywhere I can, trying to get those solutions from the quadratic formula that I was missing at the start of the problem. All right, so the list of, the complete list of solutions for this function would be the four that we began the problem with. Remember, that's what unlocked the whole quadratic function that would allow us to find more solutions, we were given this one solution at the start. So don't forget to include it in your answers. And then also list out the answers that we had to work hard for. Finding the 3 and the negative 1 from the quadratic formula was a lot more work than finding the 4 that was just given to us in the problem. But there is our complete set of solutions. All right, I'm going to leave you to do example five, and then I will come back in a moment and work through number six with you. Oh, wait! Did you have fun on that one? I like this one. Good stuff. All right, so for problem five, we end up getting the quadratic you see here. And after doing quadratic formula, we get the two additional solutions of 3 and negative 6. So please note that my answer set, the solution set, has all three answers in it. 2, positive 3, and negative 6. I didn't really care what order they went in, so I just slapped them in there. All right, example 6 and 7 are of the same level of difficulty as 4 and 5. The only difference is when you get down to the end, the a value is not a 1. That just means that if you're going to be factoring, that your factoring would become more complicated. But if we're doing quadratic formula, it's the same level of difficulty. So for example 6, just one more to work through together. I'm going to pull all of the numbers that I need from the equation and dump the x's. So that's 3, 13, 13, 3. And then I'm going to take the solution, negative 3, that I have to divide by, and put that in front of the synthetic division. Do not take the opposite. All right, then do your synthetic division. Drop that first number down. Multiply back times the divisor. Add down. Repeat. So, answer is? 3x squared plus 4x plus 1 equals 0. And the quadratic formula for that looks like negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 4 squared minus 4 times 3 times 1 all over 2 times 3. So inside the square root, that boils down to just a 4. And this is the rest of our solution. 
negative 4, plus or minus the square root of 4 over 6. But thankfully, square root of 4 is a nice, simple answer of 2. So that gives us the ability to split this apart and get two sensible answers. On the first one, when we take negative 4 plus 2 and divide that result by 6, that gives us a fraction. When we take the second one and do the negative case, negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6. Divide that by 6, we get negative 1. So in the end, our solutions that we had to work hard to find are negative 1 third and negative 1. And we were given negative 3 in the beginning for free. So we want to include all of those in our final answers. All right, one more time. I'm going to pause the video and give you a minute to do the last problem. And then you can come back and check your results with me when you're done. And we're back. And for the last problem, after doing the synthetic division, our leftover function becomes 5x squared minus 4x minus 1. And solving that with quadratic formula leads to two additional solutions. And the complete solution set is listed there. All right. I hope you have thoroughly enjoyed finding all of the zeros of polynomial functions today. Tomorrow, come back for more, a little bit of practice, and a few more tips. Stay safe, everybody. Make smart choices. And stay home. See you all later.